Hi guys, I'm very excited about this book club. We're going to go through this book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And, and our goal is to first love our God with our mind. We're all familiar with the passage that we have to love our God with our heart, soul, and mind. And sometimes we forget that we have to love our God with our mind. And sometimes it is kind of hard to love God when certain things don't make sense with our mind, right? Our second goal is to have fun. Trust me. Uh, learning about reality, you know, qu learning about why we believe in certain things and what should we believe in and those things are actually really fun. It's like a Lakers game. Uh, I feel like a father taking his, his little son to a Lakers game where the son doesn't really know anything about the Lakers and teaching his son how to enjoy a Lakers game you know, so that when the son grows up he can enjoy the Lakers game on his own. First of all, I'd like to start this book club by asking you a few questions. Why did you choose this book club? What are you expecting from this book club? Do you guys like to think about reality? Are you a Christian? If you are, what does it mean to be a Christian? How do you know if God is real? When I was young, I didn't really care about reality and what I believe in. And I never questioned about my beliefs. And I was totally fine with it. You know, life was entertaining, you know, I love Pokemon and studying about Pokemon brought me life. And I accepted whatever my parents told me as true. But there are two incidents that changed me. Uh, first, I had a heated argument with my classmates and I claimed that the universe was created by God and they claimed that no, the universe was not created by God, but through this process of evolution. The support that we had was my mother and my father told me that the universe was created by God and their parents told him that the universe was created through this process of evolution and in order to support that what our parents are telling is true we told each other how smart our parents were and I told them that my parents have PhDs and it just happens that their parents also have PhD too and this whole confusion led me that maybe we shouldn't accept everything that our parents tell us without fully understanding their logical reasons of their claim. And the second incident was when I was in ninth grade, I had this crush with this one girl. And until when I was in ninth grade, I always had this list of what kind of girls I liked. You know, such thing as, you know, play violin, short, have long hair, uh, quiet. But then this girl that I liked in ninth grade, she was the opposite from my list and I was so curious about, okay, why do I like this girl? And when she started dating, uh, I started to feel this depression and I no longer wanted to like this girl, but in involuntarily, uh, I was liking this girl. And literally what she did was she took my heart and then I want that heart back. So I started asking, okay, why do I not have a choice in terms of to either like or dislike a person? And this whole incident starts making me question about, okay, why am I this way or why am I that way? What is this thing about attraction? And it made me start thinking about everything in life, which smoothly led me into another incident, which was uh, I saw these North Koreans who generally love their leader, Kim Jong-il. And we all say that they're brainwashed to love their leaders because you know, in reality, they are bad leaders. You know, they're the reason why they are starving. And when I saw them genuinely love their leader, I start questioning, am I brainwashed to be a Christian? Why do I love God? How do I even know that he exists? How do I know if God is good? So these are the incidents why these kind of questions pop up into my mind. And I hope you guys will go through these kinds of questions in your life too. This book will not answer everything about the question, but I think it's a very good first step. And hopefully, you will be able to engage more into theology and philosophy and thinking about these questions and we'll be able to build a relationship where we can discuss and have a lot of uh, confusing questions answered so that we will able to answer those confusing questions that hinders us to love our God with our mind. Okay, first of all, I'd like to go through some background knowledge. In terms of beliefs in God, uh, there are those who believe there is a God and there are those who believe there is no God and there are those who claims that we don't know and there's no way for us to find out if there is or not a God. For those who say that we don't know if there is a God or we cannot find out, we call them agnostic. But about being agnostic, it's not only about 
not knowing or cannot know if there is a God, these are also the people who just don't care if there is a God or not. They just don't care about these topics. And for those who believe that there is no God, they are, they are the ones who genuinely believe that there is no God and they have a strong logical supporting argument or reasoning for that belief. So a lot of your friends who claims to be atheists are actually agnostic because they just don't know or they just don't care. And those who believe there is a God, it divides into two branches, which is theism and deism. Uh, those who are deists, uh, they believe that by looking at nature, you have to believe that there is a God. But this creator does not interact with his own creation. So a great analogy will be like a watchmaker. Uh, after a, a watchmaker creates a watch, he can just leave and have no interactions with the watch, but then the watch will be able to function on its own. Those who are theists, they believe that not only that God created the universe, but the, the God interacts with the universe and he, he reveals himself and interacts with it. So even among theists, it's divided into branches such as monotheism, and polytheism, and pantheism. In monotheism, they believe in one God or the oneness of God. A uh, good example will be Christianity, Judaism, and also Islam. You might ask a question, what about the Trinity? Isn't it three? Isn't it three being? Isn't that pantheism? Well, let's remember the definition of not only just one God, but the oneness of God. The Trinity, even these three different beings, they act as if they're one being, right? They're in one team. So another one is polytheism. In polytheism, they believe in many gods. A good example would be the, the Greek gods. And another belief is uh, pantheism. In pantheism, they believe that everything is part of God or everything is God. Uh, a good example of pantheism will be Hinduism. And even among Christianity, there are two different denominations such as Southern Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, and the Church of England. And the author, he is part of the Church of England. It is not the author's intention through this book to lead someone to the Church of England. The author's intention is to lead someone to Christianity. He doesn't care which denomination you join into. So if you look at book one, in the first three chapters, he leads you to believe that there is God and there must be one God. And, and then at the end of chapter 4, he invites you to Christianity. He doesn't fully support Christianity yet, but he gives you an invitation at the end of chapter 4. Oh, if you read the preface, uh, he talks about the definition of what it means to be a Christian. And he overly emphasizes about why it's important to keep this definition of Christian, which is one who accepts the common doctrine of Christianity. He said that we shouldn't overly deepen the meaning and overly spiritualize it, such as, as one who, whose spirit is closer to Jesus or anything like that. And the reason why he does it is because the danger of doing that, you might end up polluting the term. And it's important to keep its original meaning. And the original meaning is actually from Acts chapter 11 verse 26, it says that the definition of Christian means to those who accepted the teachings of the apostles. And in order to give a, an example of why it's important to not deepen the meaning, he gives an example with the word gentleman. Apparently the original meaning of gentleman meant one who had a coat of arms and some landed property. So it wasn't a contradiction when you call someone a gentleman, but also not well-mannered. When you call someone a gentleman, it wasn't really a compliment. And if you call someone is not a gentleman, it wasn't an insult. It was just a state of fact. But now the definition of gentleman has changed into someone who is well-mannered and nice. So if you call someone a gentleman, it became a compliment. And if you call someone is not a gentleman, it became an insult. And now the original meaning of gentleman has disappeared. The word has become polluted. So let's keep the definition of Christian means the one who accepts the doctrine of Christianity. Now about, more about the book. This book was written right after World War II and a lot of British people were, were start questioning about the goodness of God, the existence of God, and also about evil because they went through such tragic incidents such as you know Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. 
So this writing was actually written as a radio talk to answer those questions and now it became a book. So throughout the book, you'll see a lot of uh, mentioning about the Nazi Germany. Now that we have some time left, let's talk, let's talk about uh, book one, chapter one. In chapter one, he mentions about the law of human nature. Uh, when you're arguing or quarreling with others, you're not just saying that what that person is bringing you inconvenience, you're also saying that, that what that person is doing is wrong. What does it mean to be wrong? It means that there must be some moral standard that exists that we have to use it and obligated to obey it. So this moral standard, we'll call this the law of human nature. You also might have heard another term called the law of nature. You know, you know the law of nature such as like gravity, also the chemical nature and you know, those kind of stuff. So what's the difference between the law of nature and the law of human nature? Well, in the law of nature, you're forced to obey it. But in the law of human nature, you choose to obey it. We just feel that like we ought to obey it. And human belief, what is acceptable or not? We have a center right all around the world and, and throughout history. You might say that different people have different opinions about what is right and wrong, but if you really look at the essence of it, they're actually the same. When you look at the differences, it's actually very small. There's no such thing as a total different in terms of what we believe is right and wrong. For an example, we all believe that killing someone without any reason is wrong. We might differ in what is a valid reason to kill someone, but we all believe that killing someone without any reason is wrong. And for those who claim that they don't believe in the real right and wrong, they actually do believe in the real right and wrong. If you, actually, if you mistreat them or break their promise, you know, they'll complain to you by saying that they're not being treated fairly. And when they say they're not being treated fairly, they're not only telling you that what they're doing is just bring them inconveniences, they're telling you that you have to obey this, this moral standard. And among those people, you know, there must be something that they strongly believe in. You know, if there happens to be an environmentalist, if you pour a bunch of toxin in, in a lake and kill all the fish, they'll tell you what you're doing is wrong. And you can respond by saying, Hey, um, I didn't bring you any inconvenience. You live actually 500 miles away from the lake. It's not going to directly affect you, but they're going to tell you that what you have done is just wrong or bad. So again, you prove them that they actually believe in a real right and wrong. And the second point that the author mentions about in chapter one is we are all aware about this moral standard and we don't obey it. We break it. And that's it. So chapter one, the two important points of chapter one is first, there is this thing of law of human nature. And second, we are aware of it, but we break it. All right, see you guys on Sunday.